I'm Diane Fugino, a professor of Asian American Studies at UCSB. And um, we are here to, we wanna start by acknowledging the moment that we are in, this difficult period with Uvalde, Buffalo, Southern California, happening all at this moment at the second year anniversary of the police killing of George Floyd. So we wanted to start with just a moment of silence. Thank you so much for sharing in with this. And we also want to acknowledge that we are participating um, from physical locations, from uh, virtually, from across the country and perhaps beyond. And if you are joining us from anywhere, um, we want to acknowledge that we are living on lands that have been violently stolen from native first peoples. And I want to invite us to acknowledge that many of us find ourselves in North America as a consequence of the colonial and imperial violence, which forcibly displayed, displaced our ancestors. And that is certainly true for me um, as a woman of Japanese American descent. As the main host for this virtual event, the Asian American Studies Center at UCLA acknowledges our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino and Tongva peoples. And we want to thank our co-sponsors, um, UCLA's uh, Asian American Studies Department, UCSB's Asian American Studies Department, the UC Davis Bulasan Center for Philippinex Studies, the UC Davis Asian American Studies, CSU San Marcos Ethnic Studies Department, and the University of San Diego Ethnic Studies Department. Today's webinar ends a series of programs organized around our book, Contemporary Asian American Activism, Building Movements for Liberation. And in the struggles for prison abolition, global anti-imperialism, immigrant rights, affordable housing, environmental justice, fair labor, and more, 21st century Asian American activists are speaking out and standing up to systems of oppression through our activism and organizing is too often invisibilized. Bringing together grassroots organizers and scholar activists, our contributors demonstrate that emancipatory futures require collective action and recipro reciprocal relationships that are nurtured over time and forged through cross-racial solidarity and intergenerational connections. Our contributors present lived experiences of the fight for transformative justice and offer lessons to ensure the longevity and fight for transformational justice um, I, 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 for the, that ensures longevity and sustainability, right? In the face of imperialism, white supremacy, racial capitalism, heteropatriarchy, ableism, and more, our contributors celebrate victories and assess failures, reflect on the trials of activist life, critically examine long-term movement building, and inspire continued mobilization for coming generations. Today's webinar focuses on the final section of the book, um, and I want to quickly go over our agenda for today. First, I'll provide the overarching um, overview, an overview of the entire book, and the contributors for the final section will provide self-introductions and brief introductions of the chapters. Third, I will lead a moderated discussion with um, questions directed to each panelist. And finally, we will open this up to Q&A. So if you have questions um, or comments, we really encourage you, we would like this to be participatory. Please drop them in the Q&A. Okay. Though I've touched a little on what the book is about, I wanna briefly offer some background. And I, um, First, this is a collaboration with Robin to uplift Asian American activism as part of our work in con commemorating the 50th anniversary of the field of Asian American studies and ethnic studies. And our general concerns 
that both the scholarship and popular discourse has brought very little attention to the issue of Asian American activism. This builds on work that Robin and I did with UCLA's Asian American Studies Center, um, co-editing a special volume on Asian American activism studies uh, published in Amerasia Journal in 2019. Um, and we also, in conversation with our collaborators, had a symposium held at UCSB in January of 2019 to bring together voices to think through publicly affirming and, and, and uh, highlighting the kind of work that uh, the contributors of this volume are doing, and also having closed door sessions so that we can think about the state of Asian American activism. And we identify several important lessons from the Asian American movement of 50 years ago that continue to be relevant to today's Asian American organizing. One, political education. Two, radical love, relationships and community building and collective leadership. Three, radicalism and anti-imperialism. Four, cross-racial solidarities. And five, internationalism. Today's webinar ends a series of four sessions which draw out these lessons across different issues and movements. And I believe that the recording of this will be available um, in June and posted on the UCLA's Asian American Studies website. Um, I now turn to the different speakers for today and um, ask them to introduce themselves and to discuss their book chapters. Our first speaker is Alex Tom. Hi, Diane, and thank you. It's been an honor to just be part of this book and and I'm holding a lot of the heaviness, um, as you mentioned, Diane. I have a seven-year-old, and um, and night of the shooting, and all the other things. Um, he was just saying how he doesn't feel safe to be in school, and it was literally the last last day of school. So, and that's what emboldens me to stay in this movement and to just know that we are in the long arc of struggle and that our ancestors have seen a lot and they continue to push us forward. So holding all of that. So I wanted to um, just share, it's been an honor to just even be part of this um, project because one is, um, and I'll, yeah, thank you, Melanie, for sharing the slides. So the, the first thing I just wanted to share is just that what's really important and as there's a lot of students here um, watching it's important that we we write our experiences and our lessons and this is one of the most important things about praxis it's a theory and the practice of and reflecting on what you've done and so um, this whole book is um, written by practitioners people who have done the work people who took ethnic studies classes people who basically have been really working with people in the community for a very long time. And so it was an honor for me to be able to do that. So I just want to do a little bit of introduction myself and what I write about in the chapter. Here's a picture of my, my son um, and um, him at one of the gatherings at the Chinese Progressive Association. I like to share with people is that he is um, a awesome and autistic seven-year-old that has totally changed and repoliticized my life, understanding what kind of world we're trying to build that is um, fighting ableism as well. And um, can you click the next one, Melanie? And a lot of my writing comes from the fact that I got politicized at a very young age in high school. This picture looks very old. It is in fact from 1992 and you can see I'm right there. Actually, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but um, I got politicized in these youth programs and that's why uh, the youth organizing youth development is very, very close to my heart. So, so yeah, next one. So what I write about a lot is the long arc and this is a picture of our elders in the 1930s, the predecessors of CPA. You can go to the next one. 
Eva Lowe, who was still in Chinatown when I started at CPA uh, now 20 years ago, and she's pictured here in the middle. We formed a fellowship after her called the Eva Lowe Fellowship. And then we later, we expanded it to be called the Seating Change Fellowship, which some of you already know about. And um, you can, next slide. And so we come from a lineage from the 30s to the 70s of the I Hotel struggle, um, the Black Power movement, Asian and Latino um, indigenous movements. And this is the this is what keeps us going, looking back and looking forward, taking the best lessons. And we also know right now, you can take the next slide. We know that there is um, the rise of the right wing as well. And that's what my chapter is about. It's about how do we, in this period of time, um, like movement, our movement praxis, right? And that's really important. So you can go to the next one. And so this is just a picture of um, the Chinese Americans for Trump at the Republican Leadership Institute. And it's important to just share that this is not just about Chinese people, but it's about us living in a period of conservatism and what is it going to take for us to basically move um, and deal with some so much of the harm in the last uh, under Trumpism. And what I write about is movement praxis. And um, what um, I did in my time at CPA is help to start Seeding Change, which is a program for young Asian Americans who are interested in organizing. Um, you can go to the next slide. I'm not sure if I, yeah, uh, let's, let's, yeah, yeah, you can, you can stay on this one. You can click the next one. And, and so I'll just kind of like close on this one since um, I don't want to make it too long. But um, what I notice is that in our generation, and I include myself as a 46 year old part of this generation of young people, is that we are an era of facing multiple things around the society. Uh, consolidating around capital and pushing divisions, fracturing isolation and competition. And there are three P's that permeate through our society. And there are more than just three P's. But the ones that I write about are around purism, perfectionism, and pessimism. Purism is very deep because it pushes us to really think about everything as ideologically very pure, right? When in fact, what, what comes, what is really important is us, us learning how to struggle together, right? And being able to sharpen our thinking together. Second one is perfectionism. And I find this happens a lot in the Asian American community where we wanna get everything right and perfect before anything comes out publicly. And what ends up happening is it, it makes us not do anything right, or makes us very isolated. And last one is pessimism. And this is what I saw with a lot of young people is just not believing change is possible. And how do we combat our own pessimism? So if it's like pessimism about yourself, not being able to do X, Y, and Z, if it's pessimism about other people, not trusting other people, or just changing the, changing the world that we're in right now. And so that's, that's what I write about in my chapter. And it comes from a lot of conversations with young people um, in the Seating Change program, but also with um, elders um, and people uh, like, like Pam Telly, who you'll be hearing from too. So I'll just close my comments right there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, Alex's chapter is really powerful. And for those who want to learn from a longtime community um, organizer, I really encourage you to read his chapter. Next, we have Robin Rodriguez, who's both co-editor of the book and also a professor of Asian American Studies at UC Davis, speaking about her chapter on student organizing in the 1990s. Thank you so much. Um, and of course, I just want to quickly say thank you, Diane, for stepping in as uh, uh, and playing the role as moderator. Uh, uh, our original moderator had a family emergency. So just a quick introduction, uh, self-introduction. I'm going to paste um, sort of my more academic um, bio in the chat for those of you uh, uh, 
who need a little, who might want some more information, but, um, and also if we can pull up the slides, please. Uh, but just as a quick um, introduction of my work as an organizer, I am a scholar activist and I do work as much in the community as I do in the classroom. I've been involved in numerous organizations everywhere I happen to live and work. Uh, so I've been involved in and helped to found different organizations in the Bay Area, uh, which is where I grew up and spent a significant amount of, of my life uh, before then moving to New Jersey, but in, in the Bay Area, I was one of the co-founders of the League of Filipino Students, which still exists today. It's an organization that's been around for over 20 years. I work closely with the Filipino Community Center and the Excelsior District of San Francisco, among other orgs in the Bay Area. Sp spent some time in uh, New Jersey and worked very closely with the New Jersey Civil Rights Defense Committee while there. Um, and uh, I moved back to California about 10 years ago. Um, I've done lots of work since uh, I've been back to California, but I really want to mention and lift up the work I've been doing in the greater Sacramento region, where I've lived uh, for the past five years or so. And I am one of the founding members and now interim board chair for the Asian American Liberation Network. Of course, as Diane mentioned, I'm also a co-editor of the book. And um, I am, and you'll hear a little bit more about him later. I'm the mother of two children, including the late Amato Kaya, who would have been the age of 24 earlier this month on May 9th. So just to talk a little bit about my book, actually, if we can advance the slide, please. This is sort of um, to uh, the ch uh, my specific chapter. Uh, if that can be advanced, please. Uh, actually, a little bit further. Apologies for that. Um, it'll be, say, chapter 11, I think, or I don't recall what chapter it was. There it is, not chapter 11. Oh, it is. Okay, thank you so much, Melanie, for, for that. So as the slide reads, um, the title of my specific chapter, of course, I helped to co-write the introduction with Diane, but the chapter for my specific chapter um, was Pete Wilson trying to see us all broke. Uh, excuse me for that. Uh, Pete Wilson tried to see us all broke. Asian American cross racial student activism in 1990s California. And I wrote this um, with a lot of support from Wayne Japanda, who is my uh, graduate student in the cultural studies uh, doctoral program at UC Davis. And he is also the associate director for the Bolosan Center for Philippinic Studies that. Uh, we both helped uh, co-found. Um, so the book really uh, looks at um, organizing work. Uh, my organizing work as an Asian American student activist working in cross-racial solidarity spaces in the 1990s as an undergraduate in the UC system. Specifically, I was at UC Santa Barbara. And in fact, I was a student of uh, Diane Fuginos. Um, it was really Diane who helped not just introduce me to Asian American studies as a field of study, but really um, to Asian American activism. And not only did um, Diane serve as a mentor and professor to me, but we also worked uh, as comrades in a space that we created together and, uh, called Asian, the Asian Sisters for Ideas and Action Now. And the chapter really um, talks about the context in which we were organizing and the sort of work um, that we did. I write, though, very, very specifically about my work as a student organizer and how we as student organizers struggled to make sense of the emergent neoliberal multiculturalist order that was really kind of dominant, uh, kind of beginning to really consolidate itself in this period of time. Um, we were living in, in a California that had po passed numerous policies uh, that punished Black and Brown people. Um, in many ways by either condemning them to a life of poverty or a life in prison, um, while also si simultaneously uh, uh, celebrating diversity. So um, I really started my organizing initially around Proposition 187, um, which is w was actually uh, this really uh, punitive uh, anti-immigrant um, uh, policy that really would have, uh, had it been actually enacted into law, so it was actually passed by the California electorate, had it been um, enacted um, uh, and, and made kind of uh, into law, um, 
would have uh, basically uh, made all people who work uh, is uh, who anybody who was a state worker a kind of immigration enforcement agent. So that was sort of 187. But that uh, was one of series po of policies. There was Proposition 209, the anti affirmative action, Proposition 22 four to two seven and numerous kinds of um, policies that were being passed under Pete Wilson's um, uh, leadership. He was governor at the time. And, um, you know, I actually took this, uh, the title of my, my, my chapter from Tupac, who I think was also uh, helped us, I think, as young people to narrate in many ways, our experiences of living in, in California at the time. And so the chapter really um, is my first opportunity to actually think about and reflect on my student activism and some of the key lessons there. I do think that there's still much work to be done about the 1990s. I know uh, Alex as well, uh, um, kind of uh, did a lot of work around this period of time. He's just right after me. Um, and I, I'm almost positive we encountered each other in similar spaces, in fact, Melanie, I think Bella Cruz, who is also part of this um, um, uh, on staff here with um, with uh, a uh, with Asian American uh, Studies Center, we I'm almost positive we met at a rally <laughs> uh, around 209 as well. So um, you know, there's so much about that period of time that helped form many of us. Um, now, what were some of the lessons for of the time? And again, I just want to be able to go quickly so that we can hear from Pam and, and get to our questions. But if we can advance to the next slide, please. Um, some of the key lessons uh, that we, uh, that I think came out of that movement. Um, next slide, please. You may have advanced it and I guess I'm not seeing it, but it's the key lesson slide. Thank you so much. Um, some of the key lessons, I think, um, at least that I um, just in sort of give, uh, reflecting on the moment and um, what I got out of that experience that I hope to pass on to a, a newer generation of young people is um, really is around uh, the particularity really of what it means to be a student activist. So one of the things I talk about in the chapter is that students as students, and this is somewhat distinctive even from being young people, but it's as um, students in particular have a unique life experience, um, positionality and access to resource to resources that can be really vital for, for movement building. I wanted to just read a quote from the book that I feel like captures what I, what I mean when I talk about this particular lesson. That students um, give, being students gives you access to resources, whether you organize through formally recognized student groups, which often have immediate access to funding, or you organize in a, an autonomous manner. Students not only have access to funding, but also gathering space and the opportunity to readily meet people from a wide range of backgrounds backgrounds, things that are basic building blocks for activism and organizing. So I feel like that sort of captures that particular lesson. Um, it's already sort of there as well in the quote, but college offers opportunities for in-class and out-of-class learning. Um, there really, really is so much, certainly you know, being having access to ethics studies courses is important, but being able to even gather with people, with like-minded young people um, in the dorms, in the apartments you share, be becomes also an opportunity for out-of-class learning experiences that you really aren't able to have again later on in your life after you are no longer a student. I also talk about a lesson being that um, college offers opportunities to build organizing experience, including cross-racial solidarity. Again, whether it's an organization that's formally recognized by the university or not, you get to learn to organize, you get to kind of get your feet wet. And even more so, you're able to, to, to take advantage of, be, of um, the diversity that does exist, even though we could use more of it at, at, on our campus. But you have this opportunity to build this relationships and build cross-racial solidarity, again, in ways that sometimes aren't often available outside of the college experience, given the ways that American society can be so deeply uh, segregated in the workplaces and in neighborhoods. So I'll just end there. And again, hopefully um, you're all uh, excited about what you hear uh, from Alex, myself, and Tom, and Tom, Tom, and Pam, that you are um, inspired to read the book and, and dive more deeply in our work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robin. Thank you for reminding us of the important work that students do always in these movements and also connecting the 60s to that decade of the 90s to the present in those intergenerational ways. 
Our next speaker is Pam Tao Lee, who was also our keynote speaker of the symposium that we held in 2019. She has a really long history. I shouldn't just say the emphasis on the long, Pam. I should emphasize the rich and vibrant and really important lessons that she's learned. She's grown in wisdom, working in the Asian American movement in the late 60s and the environmental justice movement. Please take it away, Pam. Hello, everybody. I'm so happy to be here. And uh, yes, so to do my introduction, if we can just start with the slides, please, that would be great. Um, yeah, so this is me, uh, Pam Tao Lee, uh, and uh, I'm um, a radical elder who's um, experienced in working class. Uh, Chinatown uh, kind of led her to my, led me to my lifelong journey. Um, to the environmental justice movement um, that is to abolish racism where we live, work, go to school, play, and, um, and where uh, we need to protect Mother Earth and other sacred spaces. Um, I identify myself. Um, at the chapter of the book is uh, uh, called, um, I mean, the, the book is uh, Asian American Activism. And so uh, to be able to clarify that a little bit more, uh, I identify my, my activism uh, as, a, as stepping forward as a revolutionary um, for uh, social change. Change, uh, the system that we live under now is not working and we need to come together uh, to dismantle that and to look for a vision in terms of uh, what, um, what, what, humanity and for each other and for Mother Earth uh, can live, can, can um, in, engage in um, and be a part of. So um, next slide, please. So um, the chapter uh, has these various uh, components. I was asked to write about um, environmental justice and it was just really, I didn't want it to be really, um, uh, um, it was hard to just to sit down and write. So how I crafted my story was to be able to have uh, various uh, radical love stories uh, that I put forward. And for today, uh, what I would like to um, focus in on uh, is the last part in terms of we will not be silenced and the importance of international solidarity. Next slide, please. So for me, uh, international solidarity uh, is an, an expression uh, for, of uh, the optimism. Um, it's it's um, optimism that uh, internationally, that we are united uh, in really dismantling uh, the impacts of capitalism and imperialism around the world. And one of the places that I, one of the love stories that I particularly want to share is that um, um, solidarity can be wherever you're at. And for me and for Alex Tom, um, where, where we are at uh, is really focused in on San Francisco Chinatown. And so uh, this story that I share is from San Francisco Chinatown to the, in, to the Amazon, that international solidarity, it can be real. And um, this is a part of the chap that I, I explained in the chapter where I learned that uh, China was going to be exploring for um, given permission by the Ecuadorian government to explore for oil uh, in the land uh, in the Amazon and in particular the Sapara nation. And when I heard this, uh, I was really outraged and made contact uh, with um, uh, friends in the Amazon. And uh, together, we organized an action outside of the US of the Chinese consulate. And here is Gloria. Um, you can see her down there um, with holding the CPA banner, but she is at the door of the Chinese consulate where she delivered a letter. Um, in terms of solidarity being real, uh, a few, a, couple, a year later, uh, the Chinese uh, uh, company that was to explore for oil on her land met with her in person. And after a few months, they agreed to withdraw 
uh, their the withdrawal from uh, exploring there and also was very angry uh, at the Ecuadorian uh, government for putting them in this situation. So um, what I want to just be able to say is that international solidarity is a duty um, and is, is real and has real impact. Next slide, please. So uh, I just want to be very quickly go over uh, another part that uh, is very dear to my work. I'm the chairperson of the International Coalition for Human Rights in the Philippines. And I went to, I was invited to the Philippines on an exploratory trip. And uh, these, these, I met people uh, along the way uh, who just really impacted me in terms of the work that they were doing for human rights and to stop the plundering of their land from the Duterte administration and from U.S. corporations. Next slide, please. I think I'm going too far. So this is um, a, 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 a slide of our delegation. Next slide, please. And it happened at the same time when Duterte was Duterte was meeting with uh, number 45 who came uh, to uh, uh, the Philippines. And um, I was just happy to be able to be in the streets with hundreds of thousands uh, of, of people to protest uh, his uh, meetings. Uh, and what I did, what I also experienced was to see the water cannons uh, and all the same equipment that was used to repress of uh, the people that was also used at Standing Rock. Next slide, please. Okay, so these are some of the people that I, I met. Um, I was particularly impacted by the middle slides um, where I visited the Lumad on their, on their land where they were defending uh, their sacred sites from plunder uh, and deforestation. Next slide, please. Uh, and I also went to, um, oh, this was very, uh, to the Moro area, uh, an evacuation center. And I met people who were displaced by the bombings uh, of Duterte. Uh, next slide, please. So where there's oppression, there is resistance. Next slide. And one of the resistance was my very good friend, Jamon Sakar Alba. He is a human rights uh, advocate, and we, we as ITRIP, and I was working to bring him to the U.S. to, to speak at Congress. Next slide, please. I was at the airport to, to, to uh, meet him, uh, and he, he landed, and, uh, and the Homeland Security detained him for several, several hours. Uh, they, they strip searched him. They harassed him. Uh, they, uh, it, it was just a horrible experience for several hours, uh, and we were outside waiting for him. Uh, and um, we learned after several, several hours, he was put on a plane and deported back to the Philippines. Next slide. So I continued on my way to D.C. Um, and um, to, to be able to present, uh, go and um, lobby. Uh, and there we met with the interface community that we were supposed that he was supposed to speak with, uh, and I also uh, uh, got the endorsement um, uh, from uh, uh, the Asian Pacific Labor Alliance. That was the start of our United Front work, and uh, here we are uh, lobbying. Next slide, please. So I want to end with um, this is really important. Um, yeah, Duterte is not in power now. Um, but um, it's Marcos, uh, and um, the I first got organized. Uh, my one of my first activities was uh, the anti-Marcos campaign. Um, his father, and um, the the struggle continues. And uh, you know, we really need to have a full investigation of of him and the electoral process. But what I would like to call on you, everyone that is paying attention participating here is um, to be able to uh, learn about uh, the human rights, the Philippine Human Rights Act. Learn about that act. Um, basically, it is calling for 
Congress to investigate what's going on in the Philippines, to investigate the use of our tax dollars. And they, they will, we will find, they will find that our tax dollars is funding the violence and the killing that is going on in the Philippines. And with that, we want to stop the funding of that, not the funding of the aid that is going to the people of the Philippines, but to stop the funding of the violence and the killings. So that is the Philippine Human Rights Act. Please investigate this um, and uh, urge the Congress to uh, bring this to the various, through the various committees to be heard. Uh, and finally, to also add that Biden should not have congratulated the Marcos administration. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. And thank you for making so relevant the urgent issue that, that you just presented and things, ways that people can get involved. And you also show us how organizing across 50 years, there are themes that are repeated over and over again, but we are not the same people, right? We learn from struggles of the past to apply them to the present and hopefully can be more effective in the work that we do, even as difficult as this work is. Our next speaker is Robin Rodriguez, who, um, uh, speaking again, who who also wrote the epilogue, and it, she'll narrate with what the epilogue is about her son Amado and uh, how we were able to shift the book um, to to honor him in this really important way. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, uh, Diane. If we can pull up the slides, please. Um, while we're doing that, just quickly, um, I, you know, it was really in the final stages of uh, the production of the book when I received the really tragic news that uh, my son, Amado Kaya, had passed away um, in the Philippines. And so, um, uh, yes, as Diane mentioned, it also, as, as hard it was, as it was, um, it really became an opportunity to also share uh, his work as um, a new generation of activists, um, especially since Diane and I had really um, imagined it was his generation that uh, our book could be for. Um, and you know, I think there was in many ways, uh, as you'll see, um, there is so much. Uh, there is so much in the way that uh, Amado moved as a community organizer and activist um, that uh, reflects. Um, intergenerationality and just the intergenerational lessons of uh, the Asian American movement. Um, I should also, so if we can just go ahead and advance to the next slide, I'll just kind of go through the slides and hopefully we'll have some time for a quick Q&A. Next slide, please. So Amado Kaya um, was an activist of Filipino and South African descent. In his 22 years of life, he was active in many social justice movements, including the movement for Black Lives, the fight against gentrification in Oakland, advocacy for ethnic studies, and activism for Filipina, Filipino, Filipinex Americans, and people of all historically marginalized groups. Uh, next slide, please. His life experiences as a biracial, um, Afro-Asian, a young person. Um, and I should also mention he was also hearing impaired. So he also struggled with a disability. Uh, but his life experiences uh, and all the complexity of his identity, especially as he shuttled between Oakland um, and the suburbs of the East Bay where he attended high school um, in my parents' community, in part because of his hearing impairment, prompted him to ask really hard questions of his own around the world. So even though both of his parents were organizers, he himself would ask uh, his own questions that come came from his own life experiences. And by the second semester of his second year at Laney in the, um, December 2016, Amato took advantage of an opportunity to, uh, to learn directly from different marginalized groups organized by ICHER. Um, Actually, it was in December. Yeah, it was December 2016. So here's the connection again. Um, I trip, of course, being an organization that Pam Talley is very active in. Um, and it was then that he participated in um, 
an exposure program or an opportunity to really learn directly from marginalized communities in the Philippines. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, you know, after that first trip, really, uh, he decided to go back um, and spend uh, full time, uh, full, to spend uh, more time um, to live uh, and work among indigenous communities. And by, at the time of his, his death, Amado was learning and living with uh, Mangyan indigenous communities on Mindoro Island. He stood alongside them in their fight for their lands, livelihood, and ancestral domain. Amado's commitment to social justice, and this is sort of a repeat, so we can kind of go to the next slide, but you know, that first trip um, was really impactful for him going to the Philippines with iChirp. And then he ended up um, going at the age of 20 to, to live full time in indigenous communities past while serving them. And so the final slide, please, around the key lessons. Um, we talk, uh, again, the book has more, but I, there are a couple of lessons I wanted to lift up um, about Amato. For Amato, organizing was about relationship building in struggle. It meant being fully present with, fully organ with fellow organizers. It meant treating them with gentleness, patience, kindness, and love. This really comes out a lot after he passed, just as people emerge to share stories about him. Uh, for a model also, there was a very clear distinction between being an activist and an organizer. Really key, he always talked about this. Uh, while an activist might be an individual who responds to issues of the day through conscientious action or outspoken critique, an organizer is one with a longer view of radical social change, one who is embedded in broader collectivities of struggle with whom one grows and builds towards gen genuine liberation for all. And so again, there are other really amazing lessons to be learned from Amato. Um, this is uh, the end of, we're coming towards the end of a fundraising drive uh, for the Amato Kaya Foundation that I established in Amato's name. Again, he would have been 24 earlier this month. We're very proud that the Kaya Foundation has already um, given towards lots of different efforts and um, so sort of supported existing efforts in the community. But um, what I'm proud to announce is that by July, we'll be um, launching our own program, also in collaboration, but we're, we're, we will be launching a healing justice um, program, uh, piloting this summer, um, and then fully uh, kind of launching it in, in January 2022. And I could talk about that another time, but again, invite you to read the book and learn more about his work uh, there, but also on the website. Thank you. Robin, thank you so much for sharing about Amato once again. Um, I know it's not easy to continually, um, you know, um, you know, ha have these conversations. And yet at the same time, I'm so amazed with the ways that you are using his life to forward justice and liberation, right? In, in, in all the amazing ways he did that work. Um, I am going to pose one a question and I'm going to pose it to Alex um, and then we can go and see if there are questions in the Q&A. So I really encourage people to put your questions in the Q&A. We will turn to those and then um, and then I'll come back to other questions for the panelists if, if there's time. But Alex, I want to ask you this. Um, as we've seen different generations of Asian Americans organize through and across the era of Trumpism, what have you seen lately in regards to how we continue to build political power while keeping our communities engaged beyond the era of Trump? How do we keep our families, young people, communities engaged and not settle under the guise of neoliberalism? Thanks for this question. And um, I just wanted to share that in my when I first spoke, I was talking about the long arc, right? And really just even being on this panel with Pam, for example, and then Robin and Diane, we're all part of this long arc and have built um, our wisdom and learning from others in the movement. And in my chapter, what I present is um, some 10 tasks for organizers. And actually, Melanie, if you could bring it up onto the screen. And um, just really briefly on this is that, you know, we're in the era of Trumpism, which is just to clarify um, the rise of the right wing, Chinese for Trump. These are not good things that are happening right now, but they're real. Um, oh, actually, it's not this one, uh, Melanie. Okay, that's okay. You could you could bring it down. <laughs> 
I updated the slide. But, um, but I wanted to share a couple of things is that with the rise of anti-Asian violence, with um, the fact that there's like a lot of tension between black and Asian folks, especially in working class communities, there are a lot of very hard conversations that are internal to our community that we need to learn how to have. And that's not gonna happen overnight. It takes a long arc of building these relationships. And it's very hard now because there's so much pain in the community and so much fear and isolation. And I think for me, the, the thing about how do we move forward and like some of the best things that I've seen, it might sound very simple, but it's like really just not getting stuck. People get stuck and don't know what to do with the contradiction. And we just need to practice on really thinking about how do we move forward? We're not trying to restore something to what was before, but we're trying to find the path forward. And, and, and we're really, <clears throat> really trying to build society. Like we're trying to be governors preparing for the next society. And that is a very different orientation. A lot of young people feel daunted by this moment, not just young people, but all of us. And so what I hear from young people a lot is like, well, I don't know how to take care of myself. And what I, what I write is um, about self-care and community care, not selfish care, right? And, um, and one of the things that um, I, I, and I don't wanna go on too long, but if you look on point number six, these are the 10 tasks that I write about, but number six is around practicing self and community care, not selfish care. And I wanna lift this one up because there's a lot of confusion around what is self-care and it's been co-opted by neoliberals and corporations. So the self and self-care is the subject, like you are taking care of yourself, but the practice is not doing it all by yourself. So too often what happens is self-care turns into individualism, turns into isolation. It turns into like maybe being like, there's a conflict, I don't wanna struggle with someone, and you just kind of leave and you fester, you fester over that. Or you might blame yourself and you, it's like a lot of self-shame, doubt and guilt. Or the last one is like really feeling like you just wanna leave, leave the movement and fix yourself until you're all better. And in this context of capitalism, this is what turns into selfish care, which is very destructive and is exactly what the system wants us to do. So real self-care is taking care of yourself through a stronger community and collective support. So I just wanna share that as a through line. There's a lot more other things um, that I talk about, but I just wanna lift that one up. Thank you. Diane, may I add, add something to my, uh, Alex's first point about Please think, dialect think dialectically, thank you. As uh, for myself, um, I think that's really important to think dialectically, and that's going to take some study. Look, Google it first uh, and, and to understand what that actually means. Um, for me, I would also like you to, uh, like the uh, participants to Google dialectical historical materialism. Um, dialectical historical materialism will kind of help us unfold uh, as Grace Lee Boggs would say, uh, what on the clock of time of history, I think that's something like that, are we at right now? And I, I, I just want to be able to offer my interpretation of uh, point number one to help uh, add to what Alex uh, has listed. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Pam. And I think that you know, uh, Pam's asking you to uh, look it up your, yourself. So we will, we will go with that kind of pedagogy. But she's raising something that's really important about dialectical historicalism as a method of learning, a method of thinking um, that we can learn from um, past struggles and also add new, new ways of thinking. I think the collective care that Alex is talking about is something that has been around in multiple struggles across multiple generations, but has been lifted up in this current moment in ways that I haven't seen before and in ways that 60s activists tell me that they didn't attend to. And so I think that that's really crucial. And it's really crucial as we've all gone through so much trauma in the past week, past years, um, 
it's something we really need to be attending to if we're going to build those movements for liberation, right? Working as organizers, as Amato and Robin talk about across the long call. Um, I want to go ahead and, and ask Robin a question about also thinking about intergenerationality across well, time as well as generations. So what similarities have you witnessed across generations of student organizers between the time you describe under the 1990s California student organizing to the current moments and discourse across UC students of color today? Sure, I mean, I, I do think that um, uh, there, are, um, it's interesting, I, I, I'm not even sure that I can kind of uh, track uh, continuities uh, fully. I mean, I do think that there are, hmm, I feel like I need to kind of meditate on that, that, that question a little bit more. I mean, I think what's been exciting in terms of intergenerationality is, um, or is the way that uh, some organizations that, um, that had existed in the 1990s uh, had, um, I think maybe even been formed at the time to uh, statewide organizations or regional organizations uh, formed at the time to respond to uh, broader issues, not just uh, related to uh, students on the campus, but also to the community have been revived by young people. Um, I see this in particular with the Philippinex, uh, in the Philippinex space, um, there has been a relatively recent um, re- um, activation of something called the NC Paso or the Northern California Filipino American Student Organizations, which uh, I, I'm not fully sure whether it was founded during our time, but I remember it being active during our time. And I remember it being engaged in both campus and community issues. And then it sort of went defunct. And it's great because this organization has uh, been reactivated. And what's fantastic is it is this coalition of Northern California student orgs that are attempting to address student issues, but also leveraging students' um, positionality on campus to, el to elevate community issues. And among the major issues, in fact, that they've been pushing has been the human rights situation in the Philippines. So that's really exciting. Um, I think, um, you know, what, what is a little, um, uh, I guess in terms of continuity, I mean, there has, there was some fantastic uh, work um, in terms of student worker um, kind of uh, coalitions that I think that um, uh, was also exciting, especially, um, you know, with the cost of living or, um, increase kind of struggle that was really at its height uh, right before the pandemic and through a bit of the pandemic, the COLA struggle, we saw these um, kind of uh, the student labor coalition that I, I feel like was very much a part of my experience as a young person that had seemed to have waned a little bit and then kind of researched again. Um, so I think these are some great continuities. I think that um, one of the things that's worrisome or um, is, uh, you know, just, I do think, um, and this is a fear that Amato used to express all the time is um, how so much organizing by young people, including campus activism um, is reliant on kind of the, um, the kind of formally recognized groups on campus or the formally recognized formations on campus, which can limit student activism uh, because there are ways sometimes that these uh, official student orgs um, on campus can be highly regulated and prevented from really uh, being more radical in, in the way in approaching issues. Um, if I may, just to quickly address, it was a really great question in uh, Jerry, Jerry Deere put, posted it to the chat just around the younger generation connecting with those from the past. Um, I think Jerry, one response I would have and might also be a way of addressing this question that Diane posed is, I think um, we really need to strive for intergenerational um, and perspectives in our organizations. And I think that's one thing actually that I did learn um, um, as a student organizer was the limits of just organizing with students. So one of the beautiful things that we learned um, was, you know, uh, as I mentioned, Diane was a comrade, even as she was uh, our mentor and professor, we, we worked in space together and we actually strived as students to work in space with the workers, the unions on campus, with community organizations. And I think that was really, really vital because um, 
in as much as we had sectoral issues or things that were specific to us as students, having these different um, kind of life experiences, people who were in different parts of the life course or just with, you know, uh, grappling with different issues allowed us to have um, to share knowledge across generations that I think is vital. And I, and I worry that sometimes we, you know, there is a way that we, um, you know, may not be, are, are not always able to do that in the same kinds of ways today. You know, I think that, again, social media organizing sometimes means that the algorithms that these platforms create can sort of not only create an echo chamber, but almost a generational kind of echo chamber that doesn't allow us to speak across and connect across generation, which is why being in, in per, um, being an organization uh, and building relationships in the context of an organization, as opposed to a hashtag or an issue becomes really important. Thank you, Robin. We are nearly out of time, but I also noted this really um, generative question by Jerry and want to pose it to Pam and Alex, if you would like to um, weigh in on it briefly, which is how might the younger generation connect with those from the past so prior work isn't lost or forgotten? Pam, would you like to start? <laughs> and we'll go to Alex and we'll probably <laughs> close. Well, just a I, for me, uh, being on the block of the International Hotel, being in spaces, going to places where the intergenerational stories can be told. So, you know, if we're in the valley, perhaps Anak Bayan village, or I don't know if they're even around anymore, but knowing of the places in your community uh, where the elders hang out. Uh, and when you go there, mm, even to just volunteer, you will probably find advanced elders amongst the group who can tell you uh, past stories in which they stepped up and got involved in something, especially when you introduce yourself as being from Asian studies and really wanting to learn from the history and the, of, of, uh, of our people and, and, and how people may change. Um, that you will find that um, when you introduce yourself like that to elders finding where they are, they'll probably really, really want to share. And we were very fortunate to have the International Hotel um, as a place where we sit out on the bench and watch the cars go by and, and talk and talk and talk and learn and learn. Alex? Yeah, and thank you, Jerry, for putting that link in. Um, Pam is actually in that documentary. <laughs> and just thinking about, um, I wrote this one section, my um, chapter around ear to the ground. And what that means is um, really practicing deep listening and um, really talking to people. And I remember when I first came to the Chinese Progressive Association, I was like, okay, I can't wait to tell everyone about capitalism and tell people about imperialism. And really, um, I was in for a ride because I was around so many people that lived through it, lived through revolutions. And I learned how to deeply listen. And so volunteering, getting part, being part of different things, and it's going to be uncomfortable because there's, there's a lot of kinds of um, frameworks and paradigms that um, the older generation have. But um, there's a lot of wealth of knowledge when the generations can share across. Thank you all so much. Um, as we close, I wanted to say a few things. Well, first, thank you, uh, Jerry Deer, for noting right this this um, the documentary Chinatown Rising. Mm -hmm. um, in case people who might be reviewing the recording cannot see the chat. Um, this is being recorded by UCLA's Asian American Studies Center and will be on their website um, later. Um, and I want to say that if you want to know more about this book, to go to AsianAmericanActivism.org, which is our website we created for this. And we are encouraging um, and want to support independent bookstores. So our uh, distributor for this book is East Wind Books of Berkeley, and we put a link for them in the chat. But if you can't see the chat, you can just go to East Wind Books of Berkeley and consider purchasing 
a contemporary Asian American activism. If you want to know more, as the last um, question was about intergenerational connections, that is a major theme in this book. And there are so many ways to learn from, and, and, and that kind of learning is multi-directional. I, my, my children went to this alternative school where we always learned that people learn from all kinds of people. And as Alex was saying, we need to listen carefully to everybody. And so there's so much work that needs to be done. Um, we started this with, with a moment of silence around the things that are happening in the world today. Um, and and um, I just wanna encourage people to dig in, to read, to study, to practice, to love in, in all the ways that we can. Okay, thank you so much for being here, for staying with us for this um, seminar today, as well as for the four part webinar. And we have special thanks to UCLA's Asian American Studies Center and to our distinguished panelists. Thank you. Thanks everyone.